I, uh, I, love, I love our first Wednesday gatherings. We've been doing this for some time. And uh, the first Wednesday night of every single month, we come together at both of our locations. So we have our South Metro Atlanta campus. That's everybody in this room. Come on, make some noise in this room. And then all the way in Germantown, Maryland is our Germantown campus. And uh, on this particular first Wednesday, you're going to get to hear at both of our locations from your campus pastor. So up in Germantown is uh, Pastor David Waldrip, and he's doing a fantastic job leading that campus, the day-to-day operations and the team and helping with oversight of spiritual care. And then here at our South Metro Atlanta campus is Pastor Ben Warwick. Come on, don't you love this guy? So uh, I, called, I called an audible. I was not on the, uh, on the agenda to do this, but they talked about, I'm sorry, when I brought my own agenda. We just sang that. So I thought I'd call an audible because I wanted to give honor to, to Pastor Ben. Uh, Pastor Ben is a fantastic man of God, and uh, he's a really, really true friend to me and to this church. And I just want to tell you, I love you. I want to tell you, I'm proud of you. And uh, I wanted to tell you just how thankful we are for you and Emily and Judah and uh, how the Lord is blessing you and your family. And then uh, I know that some of our Germantown folk may watch this live stream later. And I just want to say how proud I am of Pastor David and how much we love and appreciate you. Uh, the church is continuing to grow. If you're, if you're a part of this church, you know that. You can feel that. And it takes a great team uh, to make all of this possible. It takes great volunteers to make all of this possible. And our campus pastors, they're just in the trenches making it happen. So I thought if you would just do me a favor and uh, let's give some honor to Pastor David at, at uh, Germantown Go Church and then Pastor Ben right here at our South Metro campus. <laughs> Come on, make some noise. You bring the fire, bud. Let's go, man. I love you. What's good, South Metro? Come on. For, can we give it up for Pastor JC and, and for Kimberly? Come on. <laughs> He's like, stop it. No, for real. What an, what an honor it is to be in um, this house to share this pulpit um, Pastor Kimberly, with your dad's legacy here, what a man of God, and then to see you guys taking that on, and then just to have a small part in it all, it's really, really special. Uh, it's a gift to be here, uh, and I'm honored to be a part, and so tonight, hope to do you a little bit of justice, and I'm going to preach if that's okay. Are we good? Everybody good tonight? How about, uh, how about you can get your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 4, uh, we're going to pick up in verse 35, but I've really been looking into the life of Peter lately. It's just really been on my mind, uh, just watching his journey. He's uh, the oldest of the disciples. In fact, Peter was a fisherman by trade, and God calls him out of this trade uh, and into this role of, of really a huge role in planning the church and being a part of what we consider the early church. But Peter, Peter is a roller coaster of emotion, like literally the definition of up and down. And pastor talks to us about having uh, not just IQ, but EQ, like emotional intelligence. And uh, I feel like Peter probably lacks a little bit in that. He's uh, really spur of the moment, just boom, I'm going to make a decision. Uh, and yet even before he makes mistake after mistake, because he does, Jesus looks at him and he says these powerful words upon this rock, I'm going to build my church on you, Peter, and on what you're doing in the faith that you have. And so I'm captivated by him because maybe I feel a little bit like him, like I've made mistake after mistake, but yet God still looks at me and gives me the privilege and the honor to do things like this. So I don't know if there's anybody thankful for that. So tonight I want to actually talk from two different passages, two similar stories, but different passages. So the first one is Mark chapter four, beginning in verse 35. It says that day when the evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat, and there were also other boats with him. Verse 37 says, a furious squall or storm came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And then the disciples woke him up and said to him, teacher, don't you care that we drown? Verse 39 says, he got up, and he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. 
Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Check out what happens next. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And this is the wildest part of the whole set of scriptures right here. They were terrified and asked each other, who is this guy that even the wind and the waves obey him. This is a really unique story right here. They're in a boat. There are a lot of experienced fishermen on the boat and all of a sudden it starts to drown, but Jesus is sleeping. And as you can see, he has this miraculous just power of calming all of this situation. And then I want to flip over to Matthew chapter 14. It's going to be right here uh, on the screen. And this is another, another story. Again, it's similar in nature, but not quite the same. Verse 22 says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Verse 23 says, after he had dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone. And the boat was already considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So again, similar situation. They're out on the lake. There's some bad weather rolling in. In verse 25, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. I would be too. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come out on the water. Come, he said. And then Peter got down from the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. I want to preach on this thought tonight, Brick. By brick. How about we do this? How about before I go any further, I'll pray for you and you pray for me. Does that sound good? Come on, I'm going to need a little bit more than that. Does that sound good? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, bless everyone in here. I pray that you would open the ears and the minds and the hearts of those in this room. God, be in this house today like you already are. Continue to minister in a mighty way. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's talk about this first storm, okay? Right off the bat, a couple things I noticed about this story that seem a little bit weird to me. Number one, they started out on this, on this trip across the Sea of Galilee at night. Like, I'm not a fisherman, I'm not a sailor, but I don't, I, they didn't have GPS back then, right? They didn't have, they couldn't say, Alexa, take me to the other side. Like, they got out on a whim in the dark and just went with it, right? So they're going out. So that's the first thing that strikes me uh, as a little odd. Uh, but what really catches my eye when you read that first story um, is the way the disciples uh, handled it. Here you have guys who are experienced on the water and they're panicking. So that tells me that if the experienced guys are panicking, then this must be pretty, pretty bad storm right here, right? But what's wild of all is Jesus is just in the boat, just like napping it up, napping it up in the back. And I don't know about you, but when I'm, I'm mid nap, the last thing that I want to have happen to me is someone to shake me violently and wake me up. Right. But that's that's what you see happen here. My favorite line is, is they look at Jesus and say, hey, uh, don't you care that we drown? Like, hello. Have you ever have you ever looked at God like that and just been like, yo, yo. I know you know like all things, but but are you watching this right now? Do you know I have a dollar twenty-seven in the bank right now? Like, do you know like I got these things going on? And so I, I I feel like you can relate. There's times where you're in the middle of some mess, but you're in the back of the boat shaking Jesus, saying, Hey, are you listening? Are you watching? And despite all of this chaos that's going on back and forth, uh, how Jesus handles this crisis is just so unique. It really is. Um, notice that Jesus, they shake him. They say, don't you care that he drowns? And the Bible says he just gets up. He like walks over to the edge of the, the boat. And I can imagine he's like, yo, north, south, east, west. Y'all got to chill out right now. There is way way too much going on here. Peter's shaking me. He's got bad breath. We're all up in this thing like, this is a boat. I'm going to go back to my, Bible even says that Jesus brought a cushion. He didn't, he planned on napping. Like he knew, he was like, I'm going to nap right now. And so Jesus calms the storm and, and he speaks to the storm. He literally speaks to it. He didn't clap. 
He didn't grab some kind of paddle and stick it down in the water. Uh, you know, he didn't look over at, at like James or any of the other disciples and say, hey, get the essential oils out of your essential oil bag and pour it out in the water. Surely frankincense will calm this. Trust me, I know. Like none of that happened. All Jesus did was literally get up, look at what's going on and say, calm down. Peace be still. He spoke to the storm. Listen to me. When God created the heavens and the earth, he did not need a toolkit and he did not need a blueprint. All he needed was his word. All he needed was to speak. The Bible says he spoke everything into existence. And I believe that God did it that way because he's trying to show you and I something that there is power in your words. There's power in what you say, how you say it, and who you say it to. Your words dictate a lot about your life. In fact, in Proverbs 18, it says the, the power of life and death is wrapped up in the tongue. Like it's in what you say. And since there's power in your words, you got to know how to use the words. You got to know when to use the words the right way, when to use your voice, and when to speak into a situation that needs to be spoken into. You got to use your voice. In fact, the Bible says that you are to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. And there's a reason why it's a shout unto God, because when you shout, when you get loud, when you actually get loud with your voice, the sound from your voice just begins to split the atmosphere. It literally moves air. And God is instructing you and I that in the midst of the storm, if you'll take a moment and just shout unto God with a voice of triumph and say, Lord, even though I'm about to drown, I bless your name. Even though they're all up at my door and the haters are piling up, I'm going to bless you anyhow. And, and somewhere along the way, we've replaced the shout that God instilled in us and instilled in his people at Jericho with just a golf clap. We just like, thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, you've done a lot. You know, somebody, uh, and I believe it might have been Kimberly, we were, we were joking, uh, and a Pastor Kimberly was like, man, you and JC are down there doing jazzercise like every, every Sunday, right? Like, you're doing it, and, and I've had people say, man, you're down there like getting it. You know, you're up there, you know, doing your thing. And I just had to remind some people, listen, you haven't seen where I came from. Look, I got too much going on and too much to be proud of and too much to be thankful of to sit back and give God. I, I'm not going to sit back and do this. I'm not going to do it anymore. I've, I've given God too much of my life. I have seen so much going on that I'm going to give him all I got every chance I got. Where's my shout folk in the house? Where are my people who you a shout? Let's people know your intentions. And so do you have the shout in you today? Do you have what it has? Have what it takes. You know, the enemy isn't scared of what you can do with your hands. He's not scared of, of a golf clap and he's not scared of all these different things. But what he does know that if you can ever get to a point where you'll understand that in the name of Jesus, every time you speak it, all hell has to run. I wish we'd have some people that just begin to speak the name of Jesus to some cancer, to some diabetes, to those children that are wayward, just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sometimes there are times in your life where all you have left is your shout and that name, and that's all you need, honey. That's all you need in moments like that. Lord, I need you. Jesus, come down in this moment. Some of us, you know... <laughs> You know, some people, you know, they come in on a Sunday gathering, like they, they're not even moving. Like, I want to come over there and check your pulse. Like, you okay? You're like, we got coffee. If you need some caffeine, you know, we, we do that. But I, man, we, we will remain silent and wonder why we still where, are where we are. We're silent in our journey with the Lord. And man, the Bible says you're an overcomer by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony. And many of you have experienced some things that some of us need to hear, man. We need to hear what God did for you. Because there's moments, even in this position, uh, where you just feel like quitting, where you just, you've had enough. And I need somebody who's been in that same moment to look at me and say, rise up, young man. Stand up, young man. Stand up, young lady. And step, keep walking and keep pressing in. Parents, you need to speak good things over your children. I used to get so mad at my dad. Listen, we would, and we would needing to be on the bus. I got on the bus at 550 every morning because we lived in the middle of nowhere. I did an hour and a half bus ride to school every day. And uh, my father would always grab us. Like you'd be rushing out the door, got your lunch, you're spilling your snack pack. And he'd be like, hey man, 
We're going to pray right now. We're going to pray blessing over you right now. We're going to pray a blessing. And it would annoy the mess out of me, but can I tell you what? I am where I am because he, did, he stopped and prayed. I am where I am because my parents looked at me and said, you're a son of the house. You're a son of the king. Every time your child says that they're ugly, remind them Jesus didn't die for ugly things. He died for beautiful people that he calls his own. Every time they say, I'm, I'm not smart, I don't have it, I'm a failure, remind them that all things work together, not some things, all things in life work together for those who are committed to him, committed to the Father. You got power in what you say. Let me get back to this story before I run off on nine million rabbit trails. What's wild is they are shocked, shocked that Jesus has the power to just stop the waves. What makes that really weird uh, is they have seen Jesus heal paralyzed people, leprous people. They've seen God do miraculous things all, all, and now all of a sudden he pulls something out and they're shocked like, who is this guy? Like, listen, when he'd have made a lame man walk, I'd have been like, who is this dude then, right? Chapters before, they expected Jesus to grab a paddle and row. They expected Jesus to get a bucket and start throwing that water out because we're drowning. Get up here and do what we're wanting to do. And I think many of us miss what God is trying to do in our life and in our midst because we're still waiting for him to show up through the lens of what we think should happen. We're still looking, going, God, I asked you to show up on this day because that, that's, that's the last day I got to pay that bill before payday. Like, I need you to show up on this day, and God will show up at another day. But one thing I know about God and his timing is he's never late. He's never late. He's always been there for me, and his plan is always right. It's always a part of, of what I really needed in that moment. And so God comes to him in that moment, and he just stands up and just calms everything down. They've already seen Jesus do miracles and their, their mind is just blown like, Pew! who is this guy? I think many people don't believe that God can rescue us where we are because we really haven't been paying attention to who he's been saying he is all along. Jesus had proved to them over and over and over again already who he was. They've already seen Jesus baptized and have the anointing on him right there in that moment from, with John the Baptist. He's been clear about what he's there to do, and yet they still don't get it. And these are the people who are walking with him day by day, and I can't help but to think about my own life. Do I get it? Am I paying attention to what God is really trying to do in these moments in my life, or am I still looking for him to show up? And he's already in the room. Maybe you're in here and you're, you read this story kind of like me and you go, I wouldn't have done that. Boy, I'd have turned around and woke Jesus up and been like, hey, man, take care of this. I know you can handle it because I've seen you do miracles. We read it that way, right? We feel like, no, I wouldn't have had that attitude. I wouldn't have done that. I've seen God do miracles. And then I think some of us read stuff like that and we say, I've never seen God do a miracle. And I hear us sing about songs about miracles, signs and wonders. I want to see somebody's like ear grow back or something right now. But how many of people in this room can testify that once you were lost, but now you're found? Come on. Every hand raises a miracle in the house. Look around. You've seen a miracle. You've seen 200 miracles right now because we all were once lost, but now we're found. I was blind, but now I see at one point in time, you could find me in the club, but you can find me in an altar. Now you could find me in a pulpit, praising God and giving my heart back to him. Why? Because because he's done too much for me to remain silent anymore. The second storm, man, that one's, that one's a little different, right? Like first storm, Jesus wakes up, he's in the boat and he calms in. Second storm, Jesus, uh, you know, doesn't quite do that. Same boat, same people, and it's the same body of water. Like it's, it's all of them same spots, but yet Jesus utilizes something different. He changes his approach. And this time, Jesus, he's not sleeping in the boat. In fact, he's not even in the boat at all, right? He's walking from the shore. Jesus is in the storm. There's bad weather. It says the wind's against him. In fact, if you read the, read the scripture, they, they set out on the lake, and it's like hours later, and they haven't even got like halfway across that thing yet. That's how bad the storm is, and Jesus is just wandering out there on the waves and the winds, like, sup, guys? Hey, you know, it's just me. Don't be scared. He's in the middle of the storm. 
He's in the middle of this mess. And Peter, upon hearing the voice of God, he didn't hear the clap of God. He didn't hear the walk of God. He heard Jesus say literally to him, hey, guys, it's me. Don't be afraid. What I love that Peter does in that moment is he says, again, he's this roller coaster. He's like, Lord, yo, call me out there. I'm going to jump. I'm going to get in it. Like, like I want to come out to where you are. And it, Jesus didn't even mention anything about the ability to walk on water, but yet Peter had the faith to do it. Peter, Peter had the bold enough just courage to ask and to step out and to go and do those things. And he says, Lord, if you want me to come, send me. And Jesus says, come. And Peter steps out. Peter had the courage, but Peter wanted the permission because why is anybody can jump out and run into some kind of situation? Anybody can step out uh, and do something wild, but wise people will always ask God's permission because they know that their big dreams, before they step into their destiny, if they pair a big dream with a big God, it becomes a big reality, right? It's okay to be in a position in life where you're waiting on God to open that door. It's okay for you to be in a position in life where you're waiting for God's hand of blessing to be on what you're doing, on your family, on your finances, all those things. Like It's okay to be in that season. And I think people that are wise enough to wait for God's permission, they know one thing, that if they wait, then everything that they do will succeed because it's touched by God's hand. It's accompanied by his presence. It's accompanied by his, his destiny for our lives. Big dreams paired with a big God, always become big reality. That's why I'm excited about this church, because this is a place full of people who are hungry about the Lord and led by a team of people who dream, who have vision, and know that God can handle any bill. He can handle anything that we've got going on. Big dreams paired with a big God, big realities. And a lot of us, I know, I stopped the scripture because a lot of us, we focus on that story and we know that Peter steps out on the boat, right? And he steps out on the water. He gets a little bit scared and then he starts to sink. But hey, the dude stepped out. To me, that's good enough, right? Like if you wander a little bit, I'm, the rest of them sat in the boat, right? Right? And so it's real. And that's how we are, right? It's real easy to criticize somebody who steps out in faith into their destiny that seems crazy, that seems wild, chasing after God while we still sit in the boat of fear. Right? We still sitting in the boat watching all this happen and we watch them walk out into their destiny and walk out into their success. It's really easy for us to criticize somebody who's doing that. But, but, but hear me, Peter had courage. Peter was bold. And I believe that God is calling you in the next season to be bold, to trust him, to trust the fact that he'll open a door that's shut, that he'll, he'll put you in, in positions and connect you to people. If you'd have asked me two years ago when I was trying to decide what Winterfest cabin I was going to put my youth group in, that I'd be standing on the stage. And that last month I got to see 27 people give their heart to the Lord. And we dedicated 14 children. Man, that's just 18, 19 months. That's 19 months. Come on. God will move it. God will move you in a minute. But you got to be strong enough to step out. And I'm going to try and land this plane. And Mikey, you can come out here because you're gifted and can play and make me sound better than I am. <laughs> Hear me out, though. This is the best part of the whole story. <laughs> Literally the best part of the whole story. So same people, same boat. And it's the same lake as before. So that tells me, that tells me that the very waves that almost drowned Peter in one season, come on, are the very ways that he took a step out on in the next. What tried to drown him one time is what he walks on in this time. And I don't know about you, as anybody in here, you can remember a time where the club used to drown you and drugs used to drown you and, and, and sin used to drown you, but now it's under your feet, right? Come on, now it's right where it belongs. And you're taking a step of faith after faith after faith and you're walking out in what used to be because in one season God can cause the storm to stop and in the next season he can call you right out into the storm he can cause you to walk out on what used to drown you and what used to scare you and I don't know who this is for in here tonight but you've been living scared You've been living scared of something God already gave you dominion over he already gave you power over in this season and don't, do not write people off because they're scared in one season. Because Peter was scared. 
He was scared that first time around, but if you just flip through a few chapters later, look at him. He's walking out in courage and he's standing where he should be and he's stepping out in faith. And I feel like somebody in here tonight, you need to hear this. You've walked in the season of fear, but now you're walk in a season of found destiny, a found strength and found courage. Where's my people who used to be scared of someone or something, but now you can look right at it and say, they ain't got no hold on me. Come on, that's me. Because you know what? That, that thing used to deal with the old me, but the new me deals with that old thing now. Like the new me's got the control. The new me has the power and the redemptive power of Jesus Christ living in my heart, living in everything that I do. I used to be tempted to go out and to do things and to be around a particular set of people and to do all this stuff. But one night, one night, I came home bawling, bawling. I came home to a father. Hear me, parents. I came home to a father that was in his room calling out, calling out the name of Jesus. Save my sons. Save my boys. God, God, you promised me years ago you'd make them preachers of your word. And I know that they're not living the way they need to be living. But Lord, save my sons. Save my sons. And you can come home hammer drunk all you want. But when you walk into a house that's covered by the blood, you'll drop what you got going on. I'll never forget. I looked at my father and I said, if I, I was overcome with the Holy Spirit and I was so far from the Lord. And I said, if I never leave this place. I'll never be anything. He said, you're right. And I sold a business and I moved 500 miles away and didn't come home for three years to sober up and to get my heart right. And it was the best thing, the best thing that has ever happened to me in my life. And I'm here to declare to you this morning that what's drowning you now will be what you stand on in the next season. Every single rock the devil's been throwing at you is going under your feet. See, the devil's too stupid to realize this, but he's been chucking bricks at you, right? The haters been chucking bricks at you. Everybody's been throwing stuff at you, but what you're doing is you're catching that thing and you're just building. You're building a foundation. And everything, the, I wish I had somebody that knew. Every time the enemy throws a brick at you, you put it back and you build a wall and you keep him out your house and you keep him out your kid's life and you keep him out your finances and you keep him out who you used to be and who you were. Devil, you have no place in my life. And brick by brick, you will build the life that God is calling you to build. Brick by brick. Brick by brick. Maybe you're in here. Maybe you're in here and all you feel like is you're being pelted one after another, after another. Tonight's the night that you pick the brick up and you build with it. I know, I know they hurt you back then. But they don't own you no more. They don't own you no more. The enemy is picking on you. You want to know why? Because he knows that if you'll step out that boat, the world won't be the same. The world won't be the same. Our pastors and our staff, they stepped out of a boat of a lifestyle a long time ago. We all stepped away from the lost people and stepped into the found circle. And because of that, God is blessing everything that we're doing. Why? Because we surrendered our heart and our mind to him. And I prayed, I prayed that this year is the year of brick building for every person in this room that we're building a foundation, that our homes are laid brick by brick. And what the enemy tried to snuff out in your life and snuff out in your home, you're going to turn around and remind him that you don't, he doesn't own you anymore. Brick by brick and storm by storm, you're building who you want to be in Christ. I'm going to invite our prayer team to make their way down here and I'm gonna invite you to stand at this time. Hear me, I just feel this in my spirit right now. Normally we lay a question up. I'm not laying a question up tonight. I'm gonna call you down to a special place. Maybe you need to come down here and grab this brick and take it home. Maybe that's you today and grab that brick and symbolize that it doesn't own you anymore. 
And whatever you're dealing with in life, I feel like somebody right now, you feel like you're in storm one and God called me to this scripture. He called me to these two stories because he's trying to get to you that there is a better way. That though you may be drowning in this one season, you will walk on what's drowning you in the next. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pray. And as I pray, if you want to come, come down. If you just want to come down here and worship, come down here. Grab the hand of somebody that wants to pray with you. And let's pray and believe that this is the year that we build up the life that God called us to be. That we build this church bigger and bigger so that more people can come into the house and hear the gospel. And more people can understand that a brick in one season can be a foundation in the next. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as people begin to walk and come, as they begin to prepare their hearts, Lord, I pray that every person that makes their way down here, that you would cover them in your grace and cover them in your anointing and cover them in your power, begin to open doors in their life. And as we sing this next song, God, let us enter into a time of worship and surrender in this place. In Jesus' name we pray.